This morning we turn to the gospel according to John chapter 10. I'll be reading verses 22 through 30. Listen now uh, for God's word to you and for you. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God, take our meager words and give them meaning. Take our hearts and hold them open. Take our joy and make it full. Come, Holy Spirit, come, whether we are ready or not. Amen. The title of the sermon is, It Was Winter. Back in the day, I was hooked on the show Downton Abbey for a minute. Has anybody in here watched that show before? Yeah? A lot of Downton Abbey fans. I am a, I'm a sucker for scripted dramas, and I'm exceptionally gifted at the art of binge-watching without regret, and Downton Abbey was one of the first shows that I consumed. Anybody can binge-watch, but to binge-watch and not be ashamed or regretful afterwards takes a whole lot of practice. <laughs> Today's text explains why a show that's organized around social hierarchies that are the exact opposite of all of my prayers was so appealing to me, and one episode in particular explained why it's so unsettling when God comes to be with us, or as Jesus said, the Father and I are one. In a world that feels chaotic and unpredictable and appears to be in a state of constant disruption. The order of Downton Abbey looks like an idyllic retreat. The show is a fairy tale for souls that crave predictability and boundaries and rules that everyone has agreed upon in advance. The valets, they don't cook. The cooks don't enter the dining room. The ambition of the service staff is only to serve the family, and this is important, the family never eats with the service staff. Well, their lives are entwined, the family and the service staff, their, their fate is one, their devotion to each other is certain, there is no question about it, but the gods that live up above and the humans that serve down below, they never eat together. It's as simple as that. And on the show, the division between masters and servants, I will admit, was reassuring because it was predictable. The most memorable episode was one where one of the family members decided to reverse the whole order of things, and what he did was shocking. While the rest of the family was away on one of their retreats or, or out hunting or something, he got up and he came down to dine with the servants Oh, this was a scandalous breach of protocol. And he surprised everybody, but the perpetrator himself was not surprised. He was simply lonely, and he was looking for someone to eat with. And the meal offered to him upstairs in the family dining room might have tasted better, but you know what? Good is food if it cannot be shared, he wondered. And so... He abandoned his perch to be with the people that were scrambling to serve him below. Problem was, and this was a big problem, the, the people below were not ready for their surprise dinner guests. They, they ate together on this episode, the master and the servants, but, but the servants found it hard to be themselves in his company. He broke the rules and 
And his irrational behavior left them mystified and speechless. They were like the people that gathered around Jesus when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The holy and the ordinary, the the divine and the human, heaven and earth, they, they get mixed up and for some reason it's too much for us. Incarnation is the word that we use to describe God's triumphant arrival here on earth in in human form. And if this is the first time that you're hearing this word, don't be alarmed, do not be embarrassed. Incarnation is a word that doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible that is in the pew in front of you. We call the, the day when God came to us in the flesh as Christmas, but a better name for it might be Incarnation Day. It was the day that God put on boots and God stood up from God's divine rocker on the heavenly front porch and sauntered down the front steps to enter the world that we call home. Now, the Jesus that we encounter in our reading today is not interested in debating if it happened, if it was true. The answer to that question, Jesus assumes, is embodied by Jesus. It's right there. He doesn't even bother trying to convince his aggressive inquisitors that interrupt his stroll around the temple. The answer to if it happened is in the flesh staring right back at them. And the answer is found in the footprints of Jesus who journeyed to unexpected places to touch and be touched by people who never expected to be seen by God. And the answer is apparent in the lives that he transformed, in the healing that he summoned, and in the boundaries that he crossed. Today, Jesus speaks as if anyone who wants to know if God came to be with us, to be like us, restricted by the earthly limitations of living and dying in these fragile bodies, anybody who wants to know already does know. There aren't any more secrets to reveal about if God came to be with us. Still, everybody who was the first to know has their own twist on the incarnation. Each of the gospel writers and and the apostle Paul, who wrote many of the letters that follow the gospels, and also the other anonymous contributors to a to the collection of foundational documents contained in what we call the New Testament. Each of them responds to this riddle of the incarnation from a unique perspective. And together, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we read all of these separate recordings that tell of God's interest into the world as one coherent account. This reminds me of kickoff at the Super Bowl. I know the Mavs and Stars are are in season right now, but but there's never a bad time for a Super Bowl reference and a sermon. Uh, At kickoff, at kickoff, my favorite moment in the game, at kickoff, the television networks always pan out for a wide-angle shot of the stadium right at the moment when the kicker's foot collides with the ball. And because the game is always at night or it's indoors, And because it's the Super Bowl and and everyone there is like a tourist attempting to capture all the significant moments of their trip, and because it's the kickoff, we see thousands of flashes going off from cameras all over the stadium, and they go off almost at the exact same time. Now, if we were to go and examine each one of these photographs, they would tell us a version of the same story, but because Each photo was taken from a different angle at at a different height with a different focal length. Each photo tells a slightly different story. And the individual photographs capturing a single moment in time that is true, those photographs will represent the context of the photographer and and what the photographer chooses to focus on and, and how good the photographer's seat was But despite their slight differences, the truth of that moment remains the same, and it it can't be altered. And in some ways, that's what happened with the story of Jesus. The cameras all went off at the same time, and we've got several different portraits to examine, each true in its own right, but still 
incarnation, the moment when God got up, remains a surprising and mysterious endeavor that we have struggled to understand. Throughout the history of the church, not this church, but you know, all the churches, this struggle to make sense of God's eccentric behavior has led to conflict, it's led to schism. We seem to agree that this word incarnation is central to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Incarnation is foundational to our belief, and we agree that it happened, but we've been divided by our response to the question that Jesus chooses to answer today, what now? Or so what? Somehow this word incarnation binds us all together and and it separates us from each other at the same time. And we're free to regret our divisions, but we should not be surprised. The prophets of the Hebrew Bible said it would happen. So did Jesus. The prophets warned us that the Messiah would unsettle us and the possibility that God would get up and come down in the person of Jesus Christ is such a scandalous claim that just as Jesus predicted, families will be divided. Father from son, mother from daughter, each from one another because we can't imagine that the creator of the universe, the architect of the cosmos, the sculptor of these beautiful human bodies and the separator of the seas would willfully choose to be with us in the muckety muck of humanity. Now, I don't know about you, but almost all of my soulful meditations eventually lead me back to ponder questions about the incarnation. Questions like, How can God remain distant enough to create and also close enough to be with God's own creation all at the same time? And and questions like, how can God call Jesus, hear the silent prayers of confession that we utter each Sunday, and also be one who confessed to his own fear of death in the Garden of Gethsemane right before his arrest? Questions like, who is this God called Jesus who got up to come down only to return again and promises to get up and come down and make creation whole once and for all? Why does God keep getting up and coming down? Why doesn't God just stay for a while? It's a scandal, not because it's wrong or immoral or unrighteous. It's a scandal because every time the incarnation crosses the threshold of our imagination, we're caught off guard. It is difficult to believe both the truth of God's permanence as a divine being with no beginning or no end, and at the same time, the truth of God's impermanence as a human being that suffered and died just like we do. And the paradox is painful for For us to consider, much less embrace, for people like us that are living in an algorithmic world that is deferential to the wonders of data science and the promises of artificial intelligence and the glories of computational power that we believe will one day straighten out all that's broken and answer life's toughest questions. And so... Like the Jews that were gathered around Jesus in our reading, were flustered by the surprise visit, unprepared to receive the guest of honor. And if we're honest, if we're really, really honest, we're also suspicious of anybody that would choose to suffer and die. Considering those are the two things that we spend most of our time avoiding. This is the scandal of the incarnation. So when Jesus declares in verse 29 and 30 of our reading 
that what my father has given to me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the father's hand. The father and I are one incarnation. We all of a sudden notice that God's here uninvited, showing up on God's time, but we don't know what to do. God was so much easier to grasp while God remained within the boundaries that separated heaven and earth, but now these boundaries have been eliminated and salvation is possible for us as long as we acknowledge that God suffered with us on purpose. And those boundaries are exploded in the God who seemingly stood aside for so long, rendering judgment on the righteous and the unrighteous from a distance removed from the muckety-muck of humanity is now here with us eating down below. And these boundaries are gone because God was tested in suffering and God knows what it is like for us when it is winter. So where is God now? Our reading stops at verse 30, but if we kept reading, our suspicions about Jesus' inquisitors would be confirmed. They seem like a, like a sneaky little bunch, don't they? Well, the people that gathered around him in the temple will attempt to stone him on the spot for proclaiming that he is the Son of God in just a few verses. Bear with me with this thought experiment. You know, if, if we can set aside their violent rejection of the incarnation, if we can set that aside for just a minute and, and set aside also Jesus' matter-of-fact assertion that, that, well, they're hard of hearing because he's been telling us all along that he is God, if we can suspend our well-intentioned instinct to take up for Jesus, we might notice that their question is familiar. They ask, how long will you keep us in suspense? Or, as it's more plainly and urgently recorded in the original Greek, how long will you keep us alive? It is winter. And on this Mother's Day, we're we're frozen by the shock and the grief that motherhood has been politicized. It is winter. And our young people are struggling to find relief from the cold winds of depression and mental illness. Youth suicide rates apparently are inversely correlated to the temperature on Solomon's portico. And like the Jews who encircled Jesus, they too, our young people, are asking, how long will you keep me alive? It's winter. And I know that we're busy and we're eager to fill up our schedules with socializing and all kinds of other frantic activity, but if you listen close, you'll hear whispers over in the corner in the dark where we acknowledge to each other. I don't know why we're running anymore because nothing seems to matter. It's winter. One million Americans and 15 million people worldwide have died during this pandemic, and the numbers are chilling, and so is our willingness to move on as if. We all weren't confronted by the fragility of life and the proximity of death not so long ago. For months, do you remember, we asked, how long, God, will you keep us in suspense? And it's winter in Ukraine. God's children are shivering in the dark night of war. And they're asking, how long will you keep us alive, separated from our children and burying the dead? 
It's winter, and we are like sheep huddled together in rooms like this one, attempting to hear the shepherd's voice and and get close enough to each other to find relief in the warmth of others that are gathered around him. And the audacious promise that Jesus and God is one, that is our only hope. If God does not know the suffering that we're experiencing, then why bother? So we ask, oh God, how long will you keep us alive in our suspense? And Jesus responds, because I live, you will live also. Only a God that came to be with us could know that winter is not forever. In the name of God, Creator, Son, Holy Spirit, amen.